Thank you for calling CVS Pharmacy. Your current wait time is seven months. Seven months? I can't wait that long. I need my insulin. Huh. Hey, Alexa, refill my insulin. Okay, here's your insulin. Oh my gosh. Sweet. Thanks, Alexa. That's awesome. Oh, gosh, I'm low again. That's so frustrating. Hey, Alexa, give me some Skittles. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, now I'm high. Gosh. Hey, Alexa, make my blood sugar 95. Okay. Your blood sugar is now 95. No way. That worked. Huh. Hey, Alexa, make Steve's blood sugar 223. Okay. Steve's blood sugar is now 223. Damn it. Why am I 223? <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Alexa. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Steve Edelman, founder and director of Taking Control of Your Diabetes, and I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Trisha Santos. And today we're going to talk about making your type 2 diabetes a breeze. And while I put up the outline of what we're going to cover today, I'll let Trisha say hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, you know, it's funny, Steve, when I first saw the title of this talk, I laughed a little bit because type 2 diabetes is not a breeze. It's actually a really hard disease, as we talked about kind of earlier this morning, um, to manage. So we just came up with this list of, you know, a short list of things that we feel like could make your life easier living with type 2 diabetes. You know, and as I said in my introduction, there's a type 1 and type 2 diabetes are quite different in many regards, but it's tough to have type 2. And previously, people say, oh, if you have type 1, it's brittle. You have all these things to worry about. And type 2 diabetes is a touch of sugar. It's a lot more complicated than that. And I love this first topic, uh, which is getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah, this is really timely. And I have to say, I don't have diabetes and having the vaccine has made my life a breeze. So I can't imagine, you know, living with type 2 and getting a, a vaccine to COVID really can change your life. It, it, you know, we've all been isolated for so long and kind of living alone and not socializing or not being able to kind of go about your normal business can really make life a lot harder. And having the vaccine, while we still have to practice safety measures, of course, yep. really does allow us to kind of see our support system, see our diabetes, um, allows us to travel and kind of get a break from, you know, the stress of type 2 diabetes. You know, and e even if, <clears throat> let's say you're, you've been a, one of those very super concerned people, everyone has their own concern level. And even if you keep the same amount of social distancing, mask wearing, not going anywhere, there still is a level of comfort when you go to the store because you're vaccinated. They're extremely effective, 99.9% .9 protective. Now the data came out for people who already received the vaccine. So I really think it could change your life and it makes everything in your life a breeze. And, you know, it's, it's the one last thing I'll say about this is that, you know, patients with type 2 diabetes, we know, can do worse if they get COVID, right? So if their diabetes yeah. is not well controlled and they get COVID, then they're at higher risk of more complications from COVID. And the vaccine really decreases your risk almost to nothing of getting severe COVID, right? Yeah. So that's another huge thing, I think. And you can't give it to anybody else. Right, right. But, you know, Tricia and I both work at UCSD and the VA, and we've seen hospitalized patients with type 2 diabetes, you know, they don't do very well. And that's probably one reason why we wanted to bring this up. But we're not here to, you know, to give anybody grief who doesn't want to get the vaccine or has vaccine hesitancy. We just wanted to say that if you decide to get vaccinated, it does make life a breeze. Um, For sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, we, we all know that high glucose levels over the years can lead to complications, you know, eye, kidney, nerve and heart disease. But we want to particularly talk about first is the kidneys and the heart. And there is uh, 
I would say relatively new, I'm not going to say new, uh, GLP-1s are old, two classes of medications that have been recently discovered to not only lower blood sugar, which is why they were invented and approved by the FDA, but there's been a whole series that we call CVOT. That stands for Cardiovascular Outcome Trials. And they have been shown to not only protect the heart, but we also learned that they protect the kidney. And um, just to let you know, the heart's on the left and the, <laughs> and the kidneys are on the right. Uh, and we have changed our whole mode of thinking. You know, you've all heard the ABCs of diabetes, A1C, uh, I almost said alcohol, uh, A1C <laughs> and aspirin, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, but D is diabetes medications. So uh, I'll let Trish take it from here a little bit. And of course, it goes without saying, uh, no medication works for any of these problems if your lifestyle isn't somewhat uh, good most of the time. Right. So, you know, you're probably thinking, okay, I was hoping for something better because I already take a bunch of medications and I don't need to hear about medications to make my life a breeze. But the reason these make your life a breeze is because they protect you from what we fear most with diabetes that's uncontrolled, right? A damaged heart, heart attacks, strokes, kidney problems. So that's why these make your life a breeze because they make you live a long and healthy life where you can continue to do what you want. Now, many of you folks with type 2, uh, you've never heard the word congestive heart failure. you probably heard of kidney failure. But what we're learning now about these two complications, they're silent for so many years on that a lot of times people are shocked when they get diagnosed with right. it. And once you're diagnosed with either one of these problems or hospitalized for congestive heart failure, your life changes forever. Yeah. So we're, tr we're here to talk about prevention. And I know it's hard. You mentioned taking medications, but remember, these are medications that you might get just for controlling your diabetes and trying to get your A1C down. Right. So we're going to talk about these two main classes of medications. So I'll start with the SGLT2 inhibitors. I always say it's kind of a mouthful to say these, and they're hard to say too, but we've listed all of them here for you. There's four different types, and we're going to talk about how they work. So the way that these medications work is they essentially, in short, make you pee out your glucose. So we have a little picture of a kidney here, and normally we kind of think about sugar in the urine as a bad thing, um, but really these medications are making it a good thing. So they put the sugar into your urine and make you pee it out instead of keeping it in the bloodstream where it can cause damage. And this picture that we have here really shows you um, the amount of sugar that's peed out in a day, which is, look at that handful of sugar yeah. cubes. I mean, it's a lot. One day. One day. Okay, so let's look in a little more detail with these medications. So the SGLT2 inhibitors, they do a lot of things. So they lower your blood sugar levels, which lowers your A1C. Um, Steve, you talked about this a little bit in the opening session, but these medications are associated with weight loss. Yeah. And they have... Yeah. Lot, we're going to talk about weight a little bit later, but they have a lot of other benefits. They lower your blood pressure. They don't cause hypoglycemia. And, and something that's probably the biggest bonus is that they protect your heart and they protect your kidneys. I mean, this, this is really earth shattering in our field. We have cardiologists that can't even spell these words. <laughs> They're prescribing them. Uh, and kidney doctors are prescribing them. And sometimes I'll get a patient that comes back to clinic. They, they went to visit the kidney doctor. They're already on these drugs, yeah. which, which I love. Um, they are impressive. Think about this. One pill, once a day. Right. One pill. You're right. I didn't mention that. Once a day pill. That's so easy. And you get all of these benefits together. Yeah. Um, so really the take home message with these is that the SGLT2 inhibitors protect your heart. They reduce your risk of getting hospitalized for heart failure if you have heart failure. Um, they slow down the progression of kidney disease, even if you already have it. So that's pretty cool to me because a lot of people feel discouraged once they're diagnosed with heart failure or kidney problems, and these can kind of slow that progression. And I have to say in the hospital, when we see people hospitalized for these heart problems now or kidney problems, we're starting them right in the hospital when they get discharged. Yep. And, you know, lowering your blood pressure is always helpful. Um, lowering your glucose is help going to reduce, you know, eye and kidney disease as well. 
Um, and then the weight loss is also going to help. We should say a word about the side effects. Uh, I don't get. I don't have a slide that talks about the list, but what are the most clinically relevant side effects that people should know about these drugs? Yeah. Because when you watch those those commercials on television, they mention everything that's ever happened to, to anybody, even if it only happened once. Yeah. So the side effects, I would say, you know, on, on the more common side of side effects, as soon as you start putting glucose into the urine, you can get an increased risk of genital infections. So genital yeast infections, sometimes urinary, urinary tract infections, although the yeast infections are more common. Um, so that's probably one of the more common side effects. There's not that many. No. Um, I mean, you know, there's a very, very rare side effect called euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a mouthful. Um, but really, that's DKA. And I have to say, in patients with type 2 diabetes, it is exceedingly rare. Have you seen it? Um, so, you know, most of the time when we do see this, it's patients who probably were misdiagnosed as type 1. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um... Put it this way, if you're a guy, you can get uh, a yeast infection uh, if you're circumcised, doesn't seem to happen. So, and if you're a woman who, let's say you've never been on one of these medications and you have frequent yeast infections, you might be more at risk for getting one. But I, I know you'll agree with this, for women who have gone on these and uh, got a yeast infection, they still want to take the medication. Yeah. And, and they can a lot of the time. They can still, they can treat totally. their yeast infection like usual and stay on the medication because the list of benefits, as you see, is so much longer than the risks associated yeah, with and it. Yeah, and when most of the time when you start these medications, your, your blood sugars are high, which puts you at risk for a yeast infection. So once you lower the glucose with SGLT2s, then your risk actually goes down right. based on that issue alone. Right. So this is really the summary, right? So the two big, I mean, really has all these benefits, but really in patients who already have some sort of heart or kidney complication, these medications can really reduce your risk. Yeah, and it's it can make your life a breeze <clears throat> and it could also reduce the stress on your family. When they worry about you when you get sick and then you get to the hospitalization. Uh, I don't wanna mention the D word, dialysis or transplantation. Right but they've clearly been shown to help reduce the progression in people with kidney disease, and it's very common in the type 2 population. Okay, let's talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists. And um, I put up the, the two conditions that this drug uh, works to prevent, heart attacks and strokes. Not so much congestive heart failure. Your doctor should know this information according to the prescribing guidelines. And this, this class of drugs, believe it or not, has been out since 2005. And everyone always said, this is such an awesome class of drugs. We got like five of them on the market. Why is the uptake so slow? Well, once it's in, one, it's injectable. Most we, of them. Most of them, yeah. And that's right. <laughs> we have an oral one now, and now you can take it once a week, but also, um, you know, it's hard to teach doctors new tricks, <laughs> but ever since the studies uh, that showed that it prevent heart attacks and strokes, now, they're, now their uptake is tremendous. Um, this is a slide. It's a doctor's slide that we kind of converted uh, into a slide telling you how these drugs work. So basically, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, it's a natural hormone. Um, and it comes from, you know, the small intestine. And it turns out there's all kinds of connections between the brain and all, all the organs in the body. But when someone sits down to eat, GLP-1 is released. It goes to the pancreas. It stimulates insulin release. If the glu glucose goes up, the glucose doesn't go up and you're eating a, a low-carb diet, it may not. So it's, it's kind of auto-regulated. Then it also prevents the liver from producing too much glucose, which is a, a common problem in type 2 diabetes. And it also controls the peristaltic motion of the stomach. Now, I don't, we don't want to get too technical on you, but when food goes in your stomach, it sits there and it gets digested. It doesn't contribute to the blood sugar in, that you would measure on your finger stick. It's only when the stomach propels it into the rest of the stomach we call the small intestine. Then it's absorbed. So if you can slow this motion down, or normalize it, uh, then your blood sugar after eating goes up slower. And lastly, it affects the satiety center of the brain. What's, how do you describe the satiety center? I mean, essentially it's 
how your your brain think whether or not your brain thinks you're full. So it it tricks your brain into thinking you're full sooner and faster. And the other thing is that stomach motion that you were talking about by leaving the food in the stomach longer, you become full faster as well, truthfully. So really that's why these medications are associated with weight loss. Yep, and and the thing is, every single GLP-1 on the market has shown statistically significant. That means that it didn't happen by chance, weight loss. And this is without counseling. You know, a lot of times, you know, you go to a dietitian, think about the food you eat, eat slowly, where you don't really have to have any input. It does it for you. So it's pretty impressive. You want to go over these drugs, Josh? Sure. These are the just a quick list of the medications that are on the market. As you can see, we have a lot of them. So we have the majority of them are, are um, injectables. And this confuses patients sometimes because everybody thinks if it's injectable, it's insulin. And these are not insulin. Um, so some of them, like Victoza or Adlixin, are once-a-day medications, the Lixizenatide. Um, these are once-a-day injections. We also have three on the market that are once-a-week injections, so the Bidurion, Trulicity, Ozempic. I mean, a lot of people love that, being able to take their medications once a week. And then finally, Rebelsis is down here in the bottom, you can see, is a pill. It's our first pill that is a GLP-1, which is really exciting. Yeah, a lot of people thought it was not possible to, to make this compound into a pill. And that's done by Novo Nordisk. And hey, come on, Novo, get out with an insulin pill, will you? Um, the other thing I should say is, you know, you type twos who have never received an injection, you know, it's scary. You know, type ones, if we don't take insulin, we die. <laughs> we have to take injections. But um, some of these, in fact, all of these pens are pretty easy to use. Uh, there, some of them are spring-loaded where you just have to push a button. Which means you don't actually ever see a needle. You never have to yeah. see it, you bunch of chickens. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you, see, you see a needle, you pass out. You know, I take care of veterans. And these guys jump out of helicopters. They've been shot four times. And then, you know, they say, you're going to have to pull a bullet through my head before I take give myself a shot. <laughs> I go, oh, okay, you're in the Navy SEALs, huh? But the bottom line is um, don't let that scare you. Yeah, absolutely. The benefits far outweigh the risk of an injection. Okay. So, you know, one of the things in terms of kind of going back to making things a breeze is um, your life can get kind of complicated with all these medications. And for people that are on insulin who want to take, you know, or people that are on insulin plus one of these GLP-1 injections, that we actually have combination injections now where you can get both medications, the insulin and the GLP-1 in one single injection per day, which is pretty cool, I think. Oh, uh, you know what? I, I've been really impressed uh, when you add a little bit of one of these powerful GLP-1s to basal insulin. It's amazing how well people do. So it's one shot a day, one copay, and you're supposed to take these two, either one of these two products made by Sanofi and Novo first thing in the morning. So usually you'll have an algorithm Hopefully your doctor will give you a self-titration algorithm where you adjust the dose based on the morning blood sugar. So you check your blood sugar in the morning, you look at the sheet, you either increase by one unit, decrease by one, for example, or no change. And um, that's it. You, you give yourself the dose. Now, you, you don't forget about your diabetes the rest of the day, but the, the, the data on reducing the hemoglobin A1C, improving the blood sugars, especially for you folks that are above 9%, it's super impressive. It is. And the other thing I like in terms of making this a breeze is not only are the medications combined into one injection, but by combining them, and this is complicated, we don't have time to go into it, but by combining them, we actually decrease the side effects of both of them. And that, I think, is a huge benefit. So those GLP ones, by leaving that food kind of in the stomach longer, um, patients can get a little bit of nausea. Usually the body gets used to it and the nausea does go away after they've been on the medication for a while. But in patients that take these combination ones of the GLP-1 and the insulin, like Soliqua or Zoltify, these have, are associated with less of those kind of nausea symptoms, less hypoglycemia from the insulin, because by combining them, we kind of can use smaller doses of each at a time. That's a great point. Um, and I think it's important for all of you to know the we didn't really talk about this, but we'll do it right now. The clinically relevant side effects of GLP-1s, primarily nausea. 
Now there's some other issues, rare conditions. You know, you need to go over those with your caregiver, but I tell patients what the main thing we need to tell you about is nausea. For some of the GLP ones that are used alone that Trisha showed you, uh, you know, there are stepwise approach to the titration for most of them. Uh, but with Soliqua or Zoltify, you increase, as I said, one or two units, typically one a day or even slower. And because of that slow titration, the nausea rates are 20, 80% lower. That's a good point. Really good point. And, you know, one last thing. Jeremy says, I like, I like to get the last word in, you know, hey, give me a break, uh, <laughs> is that, you know, everyone says these are really good drugs for primary care doctors. They're not diabetes specialists. You know, they're, they're slow. <laughs> they, they have clinical inertia. But you know what? As an endocrinologist, I like easy too. For sure. But it's effective. And you're using two of the most effective strategies, GOP-1 and basal insulin. So I'm going to let you take over, Trish, but I just want to introduce the topic that these GLP-1 drugs that are really well tolerated and have to be titrated slowly to avoid the nausea, they discovered that if we go higher than the original doses that they got approved for, for diabetes, people's A1Cs are coming down more and people are losing a significant amount of weight. Yeah which is a huge problem with patients with type 2 diabetes. Losing weight is one of the hardest things, one of the most frustrating things, I think, for patients because it's just not easy, right? And to have medications that can help your blood sugars, give you all these other benefits we're talking about, and then also help you lose weight. I mean, sign me up. We should put it in the water, basically. I, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. I've been, <laughs> I've been accused of saying this at conferences when they used to be face-to-face. Uh, no one can accuse me now because I can't even hear you. Uh, I say that you have to give your people with type 2 diabetes a break. I'm talking to healthcare professionals because uh, they have the genetic uh, tendency to gain weight. It's in their genes. It's a certain type of weight. And I'll show you a picture in a second. And you folks with type 2, uh, you know, this is such a great quote. You can smell food and gain weight, and it is so difficult. This is a slide. You can't really see the yellow line, but it's going right in parallel with the red line. And so that's the degree of obesity and type 2 diabetes in this country. Uh, and they go up together. They're inherently connected. And the gene for type 2 diabetes is linked to the gene for obesity. So, you know, it's not, it's not a coincidence that 85% of people with type 2 have a certain type of weight, heavy weight, we call it central obesity. Yeah. Um, and you can't just go around telling people, oh, Uncle John, he ate himself into getting diabetes, it's his fault. And I, I really hate that blame game. Um, and it's so easy to gain, so tough to lose. So most type twos have the high, what we call waist to hip ratio. Um, and it's more the apple pair versus the Apple pear, apple shape. <laughs> apple versus pear. They have apple pears. They, <laughs> they had, you know, and uh, it's where you have the beer belly. And it's really interesting that you could push on this guy's stomach with his permission. And it's hard because most of the fat uh, that occurs with people with type 2 is what we call, ready for this, intra-abdominal fat. It's below the muscle uh, that separates the internal organs from the subcutaneous tissue. And that is a special type of fat that is genetically determined and I would say almost impossible to lose. You talk to type twos who lose weight, they've got great arms, they've got great legs, and they're still stuck with us. Right. I mean, what do you say to them? Yeah, it's so hard, but now we are finally having some options that can at least help, right? Yeah. So we're going to talk about those today. Yeah, and I'll just say a quick word about diet. You know, I mean, uh, I, I'm a big believer. Uh, there's no such thing as a diabetic diet. And uh, there's no magic diet. There's no magic diet pills. Don't fall for that crap on television and all those supplements with false promises. And uh, there's no shortcuts. You know, you have to lose the weight slowly in moderation. And, and you know what I'll say about that yeah. is I always tell my patients, if there was some magic pill or a magic diet. It's not going to work. <laughs> well, if there was one that worked, it would be flying off the shelves. 
right? There wouldn't be so many fad diets it's around. A little blue pill. There wouldn't is be. Flying off the <laughs> that's true. That's true. That one is. <laughs> that's not a weight But loss that's the thing, right? So th it, there wouldn't be so many supplements making promises and things. So there really is no magic pill. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I don't want to be an anti-supplement person, but they they are not really regulated by the FDA. So you really got to be careful. Uh, of what you're buying and what kind of false promises are out there. And I always say, eat the food you like in moderation. And I think when you have type two, uh, it's, it's not, you know, they always say, you know, you are what you eat, but it's really, you are on how much you eat. And I think that's the key. So I'm going to let Trisha go over here. I'll build this slide up for her. Okay. This is one of my favorite kind of hot topics that I think is really going to make people's lives a breeze. This is going to make your waistline a breeze. It really is. <laughs> so these GLP-1 medications that Steve has been talking about, we told you they're associated with weight loss, right? But now we're getting more information and more of these meds are getting approved first of all, for weight loss alone. So Victoza, which is a once a day injection, is um, actually approved at a higher dose and they named it something different called Sixenda. And that medication is approved for weight loss, whether or not you have diabetes, actually. You can take it, if you have relatives who don't have diabetes, they can take it. What's it's, the limitation for doctors to prescribe it for the BMI? So for, well, it depends. So if somebody has obesity related complications, then you can actually prescribe it at oh, a very great. low um, BMI, which is even in patients who are overweight and not obese. Um, then we have Trulicity, which is one of our GLP ones, tried and true that we've been prescribing for years. Just recently in the last year, it was approved at higher doses that are twice as high and three times as high as the highest dose before. So now we're getting even more weight loss with that. And then kind of hot off the press data really is with Ozempic, um, which was just studied in patients with and without diabetes. And they saw weight loss that was really close to weight loss that we're seeing with bariatric surgery, which is just incredible to me. So on average in this study, for example, the patients could lose 30 pounds. I mean, with with a diabetes med, with the medication that's going to lower your blood sugars at the same time and without you know having to go under the knife. So I think this is really exciting. Yeah. And, and bariatric surgery is typically not covered by insurance companies, but who wants surgery if you don't need it anyway? Right. And if you can see the bottom of the slide, um, on the higher dose Ozempic, it's not going to be called Ozempic. It's not approved at the time of this taping. Um, the, the average group lost 15, 17% of their body weight. So someone that weighs 200 pounds, the average weight loss is 30 pounds, average. Right. Uh, so it's, I mean, and there's so many benefits. I mean, the A1C comes crashing down. Ozempic does not cause hypoglycemia right. in and of itself. None of them do. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, the other thing I'll say about weight that I think is really important is some people feel really overwhelmed by the fact that I have to lose 50 pounds, I have to lose 100 pounds. That's daunting and really hard to do. And the medical benefits from just losing 5% of your weight, which is seen with these medications, even at lower doses, um, is really phenomenal. So, you know, lowering blood pressure, cholesterol, changing back pain, improving, you know, sexual health, all these things that we've already talked about. Um, so don't feel like, well, I can't lose this because I have to lose 100 pounds. It's really not about that. It's about small changes. Yeah. You know, my joke uh, with Saxenda is uh, it does improve sexual health, losing weight. And I wrote a letter to the president say you should you should have called it sex -senda. Sex -senda. <laughs> and I have a little video on it on our website one of my old videos uh then I was asked to take it down <laughs> all right let's let's talk about the newer insulins Tricia yeah so one of them um not so new anymore but I think new to a lot of people because some people haven't heard about it yet but for those of you that really feel like you don't want an insulin injection we actually have a fast acting insulin that is inhaled it's called a Frezza very easy to use. It's it's in this tiny handheld little inhaler here. You can see how small it is. Um, and it's a great option for those of you who don't want to kind of either carry around an injection or give kind of an injection every time you eat. But it's really that fast acting insulin to cover food. Yeah, it's approved for people with type 1 and type 2. And um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised uh, not more doctors are prescribing it, but I think they just don't know about it. Yeah. You know, who likes to take injections with every meal? You just whip it out, you put the cartridge in, there's different doses. There's a good lecture on our website on how to use it and how to dose it. It's not one-to-one. -one. And you take a little 
hit, I guess for lack of a better word. <laughs> and uh, people with type 2 that I have on it just absolutely love it. What about newer basils, Trish? Yeah, these are new, we'll say newer now. They've been yeah. on the market for a while now, but Tujeo and Traceba, so many of you may be on some of the older basal insulins like Lantus, for example. Um, Tujeo and Traceba, you know, the, I really think they're better basal insulins. Um, they last longer, so they last more than 24 hours in everybody, which we can't say about our other basal insulins. Um, you know, they're nice and flat, so they're associated with less low blood sugars and even less weight gain in some circumstances. Yeah, and, and these are truly once a day, as you mentioned. I don't know, so, sometimes uh, I see providers split the dose of Lantus, split the dose of Livamir, and you never have to do that. Right. With this basal insulin and if you shop around you might be able to get a good your insurance company bargains for good prices and sometimes it's the same price as the older basils um do you folks know what this is <laughs> this is the 1909 version of the emergency glucagon kit and um, you have to squirt in that diluting fluid with a powder mix it up suck it back up and give it to your loved one who's doing the fried egg on the ground and it's just slow and it it scares people to death because most people who are trying to save their loved one is not medically oriented. So we have two new ones. Yeah, we've got Baxemi and Gvoke, which are new glucagons. So for all of you who are on insulin, you really should have one of these um, glucagons prescribed to you as well. And these are a breeze compared to the old glucagons. So Baxemi is just an intranasal spray, just kind of like an allergy spray that you would do. The Gvoke is an auto injector. So think of it kind of like an EpiPen for, um, you know, allergic emergencies. Um, and they're just so easy to use. So, you know, the short story is get one of these if you're on insulin and it will make your type three loved ones a breeze. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's talk about CGM. Um, we talked about glucose control, how important it is. Uh, we talked about A1C, you know, that that's the gold standard, it's supposed to measure the average glucose over the past three months. Everyone, you know, most people are shooting for A1C less than seven. And you can see what the concomitant glucose levels would be. And then, of course, you can see the different levels. And where are you on this graph? But <laughs> I, Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, but the A1C is the gold standard, but it doesn't really tell you about how much you're fluctuating. Uh, and of course, once again, I can't overstate it that um, you got to have lifestyle changes to get under really good control. So, yeah. So, you know, this is just a nice picture showing why A1C is not a perfect test. Yeah. And I bet a lot of you are happy to hear that, that you don't have to rely solely on the A1C. Um, but this, for example, the average, an A1C of 7% is about an average glucose of 150. Average. So that means you could be kind of where the green line is in between that, you know, around 150 all the time, or you can have tons of highs and tons of lows that are averaging out to 150. And that's obviously much more dangerous. So then A1C really doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah, the A1C tells the long-term story. The the continuous glucose monitors tell you what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So we have, you know, two main continuous glucose monitors that we're using for our patients with type 2 diabetes, the Dexcom G6 and the Libre 2. So these are little kind of patches that you can wear for 10 to 14 days, depending on which one you get. And they're checking your blood sugar every few minutes. Okay, and this is really amazing technology. It doesn't mean you have to look at it every few minutes, but the data is there if you want it. Um, some of it can go to your phone, which is really exciting, your you know, smart watches, things like that, and really makes your life so much easier. And I think probably the highlight and one of the things people love most about CGM <laughs> yeah. is that you don't have to prick your finger anymore. We so really you, hate pricks. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So that's, I think with my patients, this is one of the things they love the most. Yeah. And, and to be honest, you know, um, anybody, any type two on any type of regimen could really get engaged with their diabetes. See what happens when you eat certain foods, when you don't eat the bad foods, mm -hmm. when you exercise, when you don't exercise, when you skip your meds. So it's a, it's this tremendous behavior modification tool. Um, Typically, it's covered if you're on at least three shots of insulin a day. So, um, and some people just pay for it out of their pocket. And 
check each company's website for you know free trials, things like that. This is just an example of kind of the information you can get from a download. And you can see this person is on oral medications plus one shot a day of the long acting basil. And look what happens at dinner time. Uh, they pop up and it clearly showed that this person has to do something with their dinner meal, uh, post dinner exercise, or maybe one shot of fast acting. Uh, so it's a tremendous eye opener for the person living with diabetes. You know, your doctor's not with you 24 seven. Right. And you know, this is kind of a technical graph, but this just shows us when we look at this data as doctors, we we're talking more about something called time and range, which is the amount of time that How you are between time? 80 and 180 um, in terms of your glucose. Minutes. And we feel like that's really important compared to that A1C, which doesn't really tell you, you know, as much about how much your blood sugar is fluctuating. I, we got three more minutes than the timer. Okay. So uh, that, that's helpful. And, and that's the range Tricia was talking about. And it's all about time and range, yeah. uh, especially for type ones, but why not for type twos? Even if you're not on insulin, you wanna know what percent of time you're in the safe zone. Um, now I'll just say a quick word about the diabetes warranty program. You know, at the end of all my notes in clinic, I'm always dictating, you know, health maintenance. You know, did the person get their yearly eye exam? Uh, have I checked their kidney function? Um, have I looked at all their lipid levels? Are they on an aspirin? Is their blood pressure good? And you know, uh, we always talk about t uh, teeth and gums because that's an area that uh, sort of shows if there's inflammation going on in your body, which is common with type 2. So I tell people, brush twice a day, floss once a day, at least one week before and after you go to the dentist. That's my old joke. You're supposed to be laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I know all of you are. Um, and I think the other thing, I'll, I'll start this slide off, is that Type 2 diabetes is a polypharmacy condition. And what does that mean? Uh, when you have type 2, you're going to have these other grouping of conditions. High blood pressure, high cholesterol. doesn't mean they can't be controlled. Uh, and you might be on several medications for your blood pressure, your heart, your cholesterol. You might have sleep apnea. You, most people go on a baby aspirin, most but not all. Uh, for you guys with erectile dysfunction, uh, you know, we, uh, there are medications. And how many times have someone said to you, Trish, I hate taking these medications. Could I get off of some of them? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. What do you say to those? Folks? I mean, you know, with one of the nice things is, you know, I'll go back to the weight loss thing because weight loss really does affect a lot of these things and can even a little bit kind of improve all of these conditions. Um, and then I'll kind of go back to talking about those GLP-1 and SGLT2s that we were talking about because, not only are they helping diabetes, they're also helping all of these other, you know, heart conditions and blood pressure and other things that we're trying to take care of at the same time. Yeah, the condition of your health is not measured by how many pills you take, although a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. It's really a function of, do you have your different medical conditions under control? The blood sugar, the blood pressure, the cholesterol levels, right. and it's all about prevention with type two. Now, I know you have some words to talk about well, I'll just, you know, I'll talk about it just very quickly for the take, sake of time. But I think in the last year, we've all learned that telemedicine can make both the patient's life a breeze, your family members a breeze. So if you're not using telemedicine yet, please reach out to your, you know, healthcare providers. See how you can do a video visit if you want to try it. It's nice. A lot of people are doing it from work you know, in the middle of their workday without having to drive to the office. They can have family members there who may not be able to be there. So there's lots of benefits that can make your life easier with telemedicine. Just, you know, if you have a Tesla, just go right on the screen. <laughs> I, I would say telemedicine is particularly helpful when you're pretty stable. Yeah. You have to drive into the hospital, park the car, uh, you know, pay for parking, wait in the waiting room, and then they, you know, and, you're, and you know your diabetes is doing well, especially if you have a CGM or you test a lot at home. Right. Um, you know, usually if there's something serious going on, it's good to go face to face. It is. It is. And you still should go face to face every now and then, even if you're doing telemedicine. But yeah. it's such a great option that can really make life easier. Yeah. And, you know, caregivers like it too. Um, we're going to finish up to tell you about some resources that are important. This, these are slides taken right from the TCOID website. You can see our last conference. Uh, we had a rock and roll taboo theme. All those lectures are on our video vault. Um, we do have the video vault. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, in terms of making life a breeze with diabetes, there is nothing better than the TCO80 website. It's all there. You can search by topic and really get educated with both you and your loved ones. And I think this is kind of an underused resource for our pa- I direct my patients to it all the time, but a lot of people don't realize how much is actually there. And you can see some of the different categories. And when you watch a lecture, you can put it on pause. Yeah. And lastly, I think, don't forget about our TCOID store, really cool stuff, and uh, to uh, ask for your help in funding the organization so we can put on more conferences and do more fun videos that are entertaining that will lead to information retention for all the information that we're trying to give you. Yeah, and any all of the things that we talked about, all the categories we talked about today, we go into more detail on the website if you want to watch videos there. So, you know, hop on over there learn even more, and really we hope that having all these tools will make your life easier. Yeah, and I think my my, my last word, now I'm really self-conscious <laughs> about it, that it's really true. Um, the way to live a long and healthy life is to develop a chronic disease like type 2 diabetes and take care of it. So there's no question that you could live longer because you got diagnosed with type 2 than if it was not diagnosed because you're going to pay a lot more attention to your health. For sure, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Trish. Thank you.